Revelation chapter 1, that he did signify it by his angel. Okay, so that's how she's, she's coming to that. So quite right. Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified. So what testified? The prophets testified, the angel testified, and the spirit of Christ was in them. So you notice the connection there between the spirit of Christ and prophecy? The connection between this whole process flow, you see the process flow again, but the testifi testifying, which is a testimony, right? You testify of the spirit of Christ. So you can see again, even in 1 Peter, that the... Uh, testimony of Jesus is indeed the spirit of prophecy. Again, when it testified beforehand, so speaking of prophecy, it testified beforehand, and the spirit of Christ is the, the, uh, the spirit of prophecy. Okay? The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So again, some more clarity to this idea that the spirit of prophecy is uh, the testimony of Jesus. Okay, comments, questions? I saw some eyes light up, so that's good. Now, I don't think I went into detail about this next section last week. So, you guys are following, right? You following? Good? You're not going to see it yet. You're not going to understand why I brought up the, the judgment at all until either the end of today or next week. But it's important. So at least as long as we, we know we saw this from the Bible, from the Holy Bible, then, then it, 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 will, it will come up again. And I'll, I'll explain why I brought that up last week. That's what we started this whole spirit of prophecy idea off with. Okay, And if you remember, just, just to give you a hint, you remember... I mentioned that there's an argument, one of the heaviest arguments against the faith of, of the Adventist church is that people say you guys can't prove the what we call the investigative judgment or the pre-Advent judgment, that there is a judgment before the second coming of Christ from the Bible. You have to go to Ellen White's writings. That's what they say. That's what they say. And the reason they say that is because she makes it clear as day in the book Great Controversy. Okay. You know, and I would say under the influence of the Holy Spirit that she was able to see that. But she doesn't give any verses for you. So people say, well, you guys are just fabricating that. How do we know that's true? So we show from Scripture that indeed that's what happened. You know, we can see all these kingdoms very easily. Babylon, what is it, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, uh, divided Europe. We can see all those things clearly. And the second coming of Christ but once you line up chapter 2 and 7 and even 8 of, of Daniel, you can see that the, there is a judgment prior to the rock hitting the foot of the statue. Okay. Well, again, we'll come back to that uh, later on. Now, I want, I want you to see what the purpose of a prophet is. Somebody tell me the purpose of a prophet. Why, do you th why did God bother giving us prophets t to begin with? Representative of God. Okay, that's good. Any other thoughts? Why did God give prophets in the beginning? Well, on Sinai, um, people didn't want to hear God's voice. Oh. Okay. So you, last week you said that uh, the Lord signed off on that? He signed off on them speaking, speaking, to, speaking to them through a prophet. Yes, through a representative like Sonny said. Now, the people had a lot of ideas. Now, you can't go around telling God how, how business is going to work between you and God. It just so happened that in this case, the people were asking for something that he was already going to do. He was okay with. Any other thoughts? Why do you think God gave us prophets? Okay. Spread warnings. Because... Mm -hmm. So um, that warning or that, that being given to the prophets so, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, to disseminate information. Okay, to give warnings. 
messages of warnings. By the way, messages of warnings are messages of God's love because if he didn't warn you, then it means he doesn't love you. He doesn't want you around anyway. Uh, doesn't it go something like this? A priest, a priest, uh, a priest represents the people to God and the prophet. Uh, represents God through, to the people. Yeah, exactly. A priest, or this, uh, today's age we might say a pastor represents as well. Now take a look at Ephesians chapter 2. Let's, I'll just give you a few examples. Prophets actually do a lot of things that we don't think about. They have several roles that they play. I'm just going to look at a few of them, but we're going to focus on probably one. Ephesians chapter 2, a few books back. Ephesians chapter 2. And if I, hey, Sister Tennessee, if, if I could, this is, uh, believe it or not, very, very important that we have an understanding of this. Take a look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. Yeah, and I, I want you guys, before, before I go on, please, now understand there are different, different groups that we all represent here. So I'm, I'm trying to, sh to talk about the spirit of, of prophecy, the process flow of the gospel, the process flow of prophecy to different different groups of people. So some people who have been uh, in, in the Adventist church for 30 years, others who have been for one year, two years, others who have who are not who are not in it at all. So kind of understand that I'm, I'm going to be trying to target different groups at the same time. So some things it might sound to you kind of funny, but understand I got to try to hit all the different groups and that's why. All right. But if, if you're patient, you'll, no matter who you are, you'll get a lot out of this. Ephesians 2 and verse 20. Ephesians 2, verse 20. And it says, and, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, uh, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So, and if you continue going, you can see the next Next part here, the temple of the Lord. What it's saying is one of the purposes of prophets is to build, for, for God to build his church upon. So he builds a church upon prophets. That's uh, figuratively as well as literally. Okay, that's one of, one of the reasons there. Take a look at Ephesians 4. This may clear it up. We, we read this last week. But this may give you an idea of what I mean by figuratively God gave us prophets so that figuratively he would build up the church. Ephesians 4 and verse 11 says, He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for what? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we come in what? unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto a measure of the stature and the fullness of Christ. So, in order for a church to have unity, in order for God's church to have unity, what has to happen, what has to happen is, one thing that has to happen is there has to be unity. And unity comes in large part by the prophets. Now, you saw some other gifts that he gives to apostles, Evangelists, or pastors, teachers. Evangelists, pastors, and teachers. You want a bigger chair, sister? No, these are good. Okay, okay. Evangelists were in Ephesians chapter 4, by the way. Evangelists, uh, pastors, and teachers, where do they get their authority from? From the words of the prophet. Okay, you guys are with me. From the words of the prophet. Where does the prophet get their authority from? That's right, from the Spirit of Christ, from God. Question. So what, how do you differentiate an apostle from a prophet? Does the prophet have to give the prophecy and the apostle? Does right, notice, notice you just said what the difference was. Exactly, that, that's it too, succinctly. But uh, that the apostles get there, or teachers, or evangelists, other ministers, 
get their authority from the words of the prophet. The prophets get their authority from the Spirit of Christ, from the Word of, of God. That's what they're iterating. Uh, the Lord moves them or impresses upon their hearts, and they write not word-for-word word dictation, okay, but they write down what the Spirit impresses them to write under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so still in review here, so I know it's good to, for us to get this review, so I'm going to try to get through this. Acts chapter 13, I know we added some things here because I wanted to make sure what we discussed last week was clear as far as uh, the spirit of prophecy goes. What happened last week is we got hung up uh, on the pre-advent judgment, and you don't have to follow me here. Henry, but we got hung up on the pre-advent judgment last week. I didn't expect to spend as much time as we did on that. So I ran through what I meant to talk about, which was the, uh, the, the spirit of prophecy, which is okay because we need that as well. Need to know about the pre-advent judgment. Acts chapter, what did I give you? 11. Acts chapter 13, actually. Acts 13. And we're going to look at verse 2, Acts 13, 2. And the Bible says, as they ministered to the Lord, again, we're just looking at a few roles of prophets. Verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they have fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. These were a couple of prophets as well. So one of the reasons why the Lord gives us prophets is to, is to push them through to a particular work. Now, I want you to look at the same book, but chapter 16, real quick. Prophets have a, partic a special work. It's different from the work that you and I tend to have. Acts chapter 16. And uh, by the way, Barnabas in, in Acts chapter 13 was a coordinator of the work. He coordinated where everyone was going to go. So that's part of the responsibility of a prophet as well. Acts chapter 16, though. And verse 6. Okay. Now when they had gone throughout Pythagora, Phrygia, rather, and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come in Mysia, they essayed to go into Bethania. But the Spirit suffered them not. And, that, and they passing by Messiah came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Now this is interesting. Here... You have uh, a, a few disciples together, and they're trying to determine where are they going to go to preach the gospel next. Remember, this is right after the ascension, or a little while after the ascension of Yeshua, who called them to go and teach the, the gospel to all the world, right? You guys following that? And so they're saying, okay, where are we going to go next? This is one group of disciples, one small group, and they say, well, let's, maybe we should go here, Pythagora. No, maybe we should go to this place. No, and now they're trying to figure out where should we go next. And now this guy turns up in vision, Paul, turns up in vision, and the Lord impresses him through vision that he should go to this particular place. Where was he supposed to go? It was in Macedonia, right? Macedonia.